another part of our London is gone. Week by week, our beloved landmarks disappear. Many of the buildings that are left are left scarred and battered. It was one of the darkest hours in the Second World War, as German bombs rained down on the UK in what became known as the Blitz. The last touches are put to breech blocks, completing one more stage in supplying Britain's armed forces with weapons of the latest type. Thousands of workers at munitions factories across the country raced to produce parts for the war effort. At the centre of political power in the heart of London, two clerks at the Houses of Parliament had an idea. Why not use the basement of the Palace of Westminster? It was a complete secret. Absolutely nobody knew what was going on down here. I think it's a really great unknown story that deserves to be better known. We must never forget, because all of them played their part, including the House of Commons. For decades, a story has lain forgotten, but now Forces News can reveal Parliament's secret war factory. Today, it's part of the central heating system complex, but in the 40s, millions of parts were being made to contribute to the war effort. Although they weren't actually making bombs as such uh, down here because it would have been far too dangerous, they were making components which were parts of the anti-aircraft guns. And these were brought into use uh, at exactly the right time to destroy the V rockets, the flying bombs which were uh, coming at the end of the Second World War. Vivid pictures of V2 in action are shown in this Nazi newsreel captured during the Battle of Germany. Back then, the Speaker of the House of Commons went down to inspect their work and praise their efforts. Today's Speaker is used to keeping order upstairs doing the day job, so what will he make of the downstairs? Prime Minister. So, Mr Speaker, we're coming down into the basement of the Palace of Westminster, and it's here that the munitions factory was situated during the Second World War. Obviously. They wouldn't risk explosives if we'd had enough with Guy Fawkes. Presumably, they were doing other parts of munition work. Exactly, that's right. So they couldn't risk the, the palace and, and, and the members here. So they, they were making parts for anti-aircraft guns. That was, that, that was the main feature. So you've been down here before, but did you have any idea as to the, the history of this place? Absolutely not. I always presumed it was just a plant room. I look around and think, oh, this must have been the original plant, but far from it. Here we are, a munitions factory. I've got to say, excuse the pun, I'm absolutely blown away. <laughs> well, it's fascinating, isn't it? I can't quite believe walking along these halls, I'm in the basement of Parliament and now knowing what it was used for during World War II. But there's so much more to know about the secret war factory, and senior archivist Dr. Mary Takanayagi has been searching through the parliamentary archives for us. It was an incredible endeavour by a few very dedicated and determined people that uh, set up the Westminster Munitions Unit. Uh, there were a couple of clerks in the House of Commons um, who th thought it was a good idea and they pushed and they pushed and they kept asking high up people um, who first said no and then they said no again and eventually they said yes. The various people, and there were a lot of people, there were hundreds of people that worked in the munitions units both as staff and as volunteers and they just kept them about it. They didn't tell anyone about it. Some of the more prominent people even wrote about working in a munitions uh, factory. Lady Sinclair, who was the wife of the Secretary of State for Air, wrote a newspaper article about her underground uh, uh, munitions unit, but she didn't say where it was. And nobody would have ever have guessed that it was in the heart of the Palace of Westminster. So this is Flying Bombs and Flowers by Lady Sinclair. My machine is comforting because it is so impersonal and straightforward and I have to concentrate on it. I can't argue with it, and if anything goes wrong, the odds are it is my fault. It is beautiful too, but I don't get sentimental about it. In however small and insignificant a way, I am fighting a little bit too. This is the uh, Labour Rotors file. That's the Westminster Munitions Unit Labour Rotors. And so in here, you've got uh, lists of all the shifts that took place and the people that did them. So the shifts, which we know started at 9am and ended at 9pm, um, were split into three. And you've got three columns here with names. Uh, you can also see that this particular sheet starts with Tuesday the 28th of December. So they were not stopping between Christmas and New Year. They were rolling straight through. And if you look at uh, shift number one, you can see Mrs Hodge's name is at the top. And then there she is again in shift two. 
And there she is again in shift three. So Mrs. Hodges was there the full day without any break um, from the work. And she was one of the most important people because she was one of the skilled workers and one of the staff. Uh, she was a capstan operator operating the capstan lathe. And then we come to what I think is probably the most fascinating picture showing all the staff and the volunteers lined up in their workplace. Uh, and this picture was taken at the end of the war when the unit was being wound up. And there they all are. But it wasn't the only part of the war effort at the centre of power. A special team of fire watchers bravely stood on the roof to watch out for more enemy attacks. Dr Collins is giving me a rare chance to go to the top of Victoria Tower, the highest point at the Palace of Westminster, to see how exposed they were. During the Second World War, it was over there at the House of Commons that the high explosive bombs fell and destroyed the entire chamber. The attack on Westminster was deliberate. Sustained attacks damaged old Big Ben, whose voice is known the world over. The House of Commons too was hit, but though these stones are broken, the voice of our inspiration will echo forever. And so tell us about what the response to that was, you know, how the Palace of Westminster was protected during the war to try and avoid this happening again. While we had the activity going on in the basement of the building underneath Central Lobby with the munitions factory, there was also a great deal going on above ground. So you had the um, air raid precautions team on top in, on the roofs. It must have taken a lot of courage actually to come onto the roofs when there, there was no protection for you whatsoever. It was a very random attack. They were coming every single night uh, from the end of 1940 through to the beginning of 1941. They had 57 consecutive nights of raids, so there was no, it was non-stop. Meanwhile, the Home Guard patrolled on the ground. These rarely seen photographs from the parliamentary archives give us an insight into what day-to-day -day life was like. You can see an example here of uh, Winston Churchill, uh, again, uh, inspecting the troops, all lined up with their guns, and, uh, and here he is addressing them as well, and you can see that he's at the Palace of Westminster in the courtyards. And there are some unusual ones in the mix. So men at work, uh, of which the best is probably this one, showing two MPs called Price and Boyce peeling potatoes uh, in the Palace of Westminster uh, in their uniforms, uh, hard at work with their buckets in front of them. We have the most wonderful group shot here of showing the Palace of Westminster Company Home Guards, um, everybody in uniform, um, all, all beautifully lined up and posing very nicely for the camera. And you've got all of their uh, names underneath as well. It's like a school photograph or a you know, university photograph. Um, but this is our helmet, our tin hat, tin hat. Um, from the Second World War period, and as you can see, um, it has the portcullis uh, symbol on it, which is the symbol of Parliament uh, there on the front of the tin hat. And then, probably my, my favourite item, uh, this little, little lot, uh, this is the Librarian's Bicycle um, Lamp, as it's known. It belonged to Strathern Gordon, who was one of the leading lights behind the Palace of Westminster um, Munitions Unit. In fact, he wasn't librarian at the time, he became so later. And this is his bicycle lamp, it's got his name on it, it's got the portcullis uh, symbol again, as you can see. Um, and it is hooded to face downwards, and that's so that it could be used during blackout, and not give away uh, your position to the enemy. But what became of the Westminster Munitions Factory? What more can the archives reveal? The factory continued to operate until the end of 1945 to complete a contract for the Admiralty in connection with oxygen supply in submarines. So much of the, the history of the Second World War has been uh, forgotten in, in these details because of course there isn't very much left of the physical presence of the, the factory. What a major supply effort this must have been. In a cramped space like this, volunteers coming together to try and ensure that munitions were produced. But over a million items? That is really going some. During its operation, more than two million parts were made by hundreds of men and women. The Westminster Munitions Unit closed its doors at the end of 1945. Sean Gwezczek, Forces News, in the basement of Parliament. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.